Poems, then, the good and the best poems at least, are told through and felt by the body as much as it's felt in the mouth when speaking it, the mind hearing it, or the eyes receiving it. The point then is to listen, not just with our ears, not just with our minds, but with the intuitive capabilities held within the vessel of our bodies. Poetry as a bodily experience. Chills, meaning, and neuroscience. Welcome. Today, we are going to discuss poetry as a bodily experience. We'll start with what Emily Dickinson once famously quipped. If I read a book and it makes my whole body so cool, no fire can warm me, I know that it is poetry. If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that it is poetry. These are the only ways I know it. Is there any other way? Initially, when we truly pay attention to a poem when reading or listening to it, we grasp them intuitively within us before our intellectual faculties come in to interpret them. This takes a level of calm, an ear-lending meditative focus, but also when a poet is deeply engaging with their body while they're writing a poem, they are grounded, more able to capture the language of the experience during the poem's construction. We even have the phrase body language, where we speak through postures, movements, and other non-verbal expressions. Poems then, the good and the best poems at least, are told through and felt by the body as much as it's felt in the mouth when speaking it, the mind hearing it, or the eyes receiving it. Or, as T.S. Eliot said, genuine poetry can communicate before it is understood. For me, the best poetry is initially and primarily a somatic experience. It engages the body and brain in a similar way that listening to music does. Many of us are more similar with music's effect on us, how it can shift and alter our moods and energies almost as soon as that first vibratory note of information quivers through the air and dances cilia to cilia down our ear canal. Poetry, too, can hoist our attention from the first word or line. Part 1. Poetry, the Body and Neuroscience In one of Robert Bly's essays on poetry and craft, he suggests that a poet, to write a poem, should go to a, quote, place within the body, bring the senses forward, sound first, then sight, and smell if possible, then to ask your imagination to bring forward the sound. Sound is the fundamental constituent of poetry. In Bly's conception, therefore, not only does hearing and reading poetry become an embodied experience, but writing also comes from the body too, as it transmits its sensations and messages up the spine into the brain, casting a symbol or image before becoming a language thought that we build into the architecture of a poem. Fascinatingly, neuroscientists have conducted some research not a whole lot, mind you, so any neuroscientists listening, please consider studying this more, into what happens with the body and brain when we engage with poetry. In one study, neuroscientists had German-speaking participants and had them listen to poetry. Some poems were chosen by the participants themselves and others by the researchers. There were two categories of participants. One of them were people that enjoyed poetry already, and another one was people who were, in their words, poetry naive. What was really interesting about the study is that 100% of the people that already enjoyed poetry had measurable physiological reactions when they listened to the poetry, and 77% of those who were poetry naive also had physiological reactions. Some of these reactions were the same that we have when we listen to music. But interestingly, there were unique things happening in the brain when listening to poetry. The researchers discovered two parts of the brain, which I'm not going to try and pronounce here. If you want to find out more, you can read the study that I've linked in the description, are active when we listen to poetry, but inactive when we listen to music. They concluded, quote, Poetry elicited chills differ from those evoked by music in terms of neural correlates. 
which points to the unique qualities of poetic language that could not be replaced by music and singing during the evolution of human forms of emotional expression." End quote. So let us do an experiment. Close your eyes, unless you're operating heavy machinery or driving or pouring boiling water on a tea bag, and let's listen to the following poem. Take a deep breath and feel the poem enact in your body. This poem is from News of the Universe, uh, a selection of poems from around the globe by Robert Bly, some of which he translated himself. And in the case of the poem we're just about to read, he did translate it. It's a poem by Rilke called The Panther. The Panther. From seeing and seeing, the seeing has become so exhausted it no longer sees anything anymore. The world is made of bars, a hundred thousand bars, and behind the bars, nothing. The lithe swinging of that rhythmical easy stride that slowly circles down to a single point is like a dance of energy around a hub in which a great will stands stunned and numbed. At times the curtains of the eye lift without a sound. Then a shape enters, slips through the tightened silence of the shoulders, reaches the heart and dies. Well, now I'm sad. <laughs> But I felt it in my body. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? How did hearing this poem feel in your body? What emotions stirred in you? Did your heart rate change? Did your breathing rate alter? Did goosebumps blossom on your flesh? Part two, out of body, the overemphasis of meaning. Now, of course, the panther has some sort of meaning. But meaning is constructed by poet and reader, and it's not necessarily from thinking, it's a felt sense in the body again. Often, and this is true of many experiences of people I've spoken to and in my own, when we're at school, we're there to take apart as many of the constituents of the poem as possible so that we can say what every last thing means to us. And the problem with doing that is that we deprive ourselves of the primal enjoyment of poetry, which is to listen, to close our eyes, and to feel and be gripped by. Therefore, the first read or the first listen of the poem, it's not necessary to say, what does it mean so quickly? Just feel the meaning. I've often said to people who are more resistant to engaging with poetry that use the primary reason of I just don't know what it means or I don't get it to think about how they engage with other art forms. For example, let's say film. We don't tend to sit there constantly thinking the whole way through a film, but why is he wearing a red shirt and what does that kiss mean? Sure, we might think about these things afterwards and some of us can be overly analytical during, but the main experience of the film is to, you know, engage with the characters, to feel empathy and emotions based on what's going on in front of you, not to bring in your brain too much and be like, well, what does it all mean? That can come after. And I argue, you know, that's the same thing that we can do with poetry. If we're struggling too much to find meaning, we're trying too much to reason with the poem and then we're staying too much in our heads and we're not allowing the poem to do what it's capable of doing and potentially depriving ourselves of the power that poetry has. As Vladimir Nabokov once stated that we shouldn't read with our hearts or brains but with our bodies specifically the quote telltale tingle between the shoulder blades. In conclusion to appreciate poetry, we must embody our poems, invite its forms into us, its sounds, its rhythms, its alchemical fizzings of our energy. We must allow it to infuse us with not just an intoxication like that of an alcoholic drink, but as an elixir, 
a true stirring of the spirit in the truest sense of the word. Infused with these energies, poetry's wings may break for our rib cages and spread out into the world. So, if you're writing a poem, notice in the depths of you the somatic experience you are having. Where in the body is it? What electro or chemical or fluid tide is enacting within you? The more we return to the animal, the primal, the primordial experience from the realms of the body and the imagination, the more we'll pluck not just the fruits of language, but the seeds that break into trees of experiential knowledge. The point then is to listen, not just with our ears, not just with our minds, but with the intuitive capabilities held within the vessel of our bodies. Let's infuse ourselves with poetry's healing magic deep within our bodies, right to our bones, and lash by lash, entice our inner lotus to crack open its eye. What do you think? Is poetry predominantly a bodily experience for you? Does it take place more in the mind and in the imagination? Do you think a lot when you're reading a poem or do you allow yourself to feel it? Do you have any poems that you feel deeply within your body or any that you've written? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want more of the same about poems, poetry, craft and writing, give this video a like, subscribe, comment and hit that notification bell. Ding dong. Uh, it feels weird saying that, but that's what I want people to do. That's what I want you to do. I want more people to engage with poetry. And I think that by bringing more poetry to more people, we can have a deeper poetic sensibility as we engage in our interpersonal relationships with our relationships to ourselves and our relationships to our communities. Uh, I fundamentally not just believe, but know that poetry has a healing qualities to it, an expressive quality to it, that if more of us engage with it, I think we would, you know, still not be anywhere near a perfect world, but I think it would be that much better for all of us. So, help us out. Three, two, one, action. Zero. Um, sorry. Let's get into it. When we... The reach at... Yeah. Language throughout... I don't need to say that anyway. The following poem is from... The following poem is from News of the Universe, an anthology by Robert Bly. That doesn't make sense. Got a proud wife back there. Really like <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Got to get creative, don't we? I hate that everything's recorded. I'm just. I don't want you to include that. I just want to tell you. <laughs> that is off the record. No, it's completely off the record. And as Vladimir, Vladimir, <laughs> Vladimir, <Vladabir>, um, <laughs> as Vladimir Nag, as Vladimir Nag. Stop laughing. As Vladimir, <laughs> fuck say, Vladimir. Not laughing at the name. Vladimir Nabokov. Vladimir Nabokov. <laughs> this isn't even funny. <laughs> See, it feels like I'm laughing at his name, and that's not the case. I'm laughing at myself, not being able to pronounce it. Okay, I'm done. No, no more funny. No. Okay. <laughs> we haven't no, we haven't had laughs like this before. We've been maybe you should come maybe you can come around and read the quote for you just read it. No, you look great. You read it. <clears throat> Vladimir Nabokov. What she said. Let's do you one more time. <laughs> As Vladimir Nabokov once stated, that we shouldn't read with our hearts or brains, but with our bodies. Spe <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I just re realized I wrote herds. I said we shouldn't read with our herds, so don't read with cows. <laughs> there we go. Killed it! <laughs> um, <laughs> Check back every Sunday for a new poetry video. There are poetry videos every Sunday. Watch it on Sunday, or watch it on Monday, on Tuesday, and all the other days that I'm sure you know. Is that all we've got? Is that only three pages? This is short. I've been slacking. <laughs>